Good evening, everyone. Good to see you out tonight. We have several announcements that uh, need to be made. Um, first of all, while I'm thinking about it, uh, Ted's going to be leading us in a few moments uh, after the uh, invitation is extended. Uh, number 619. Number 619 for those of you who need a book. Several announcements. Uh, one is Marie Thurman has not really felt well for several weeks now. So um, hopefully she's getting better by now. But uh, let's keep her in our prayers. And it was announced Sunday that Jewel Roberts uh, also for the last couple of weeks has not been uh, feeling well. I don't see her. I see Ken. Don't see her tonight. Is she doing better, Ken? Yeah, a little bit. Good, good. Peggy Hall is to have a biopsy next Wednesday, a uh, week from today. So let's pray for her. And uh, Linda and Don Adair are not here tonight. Uh, Linda had her steroid injection today, and uh, it, it went well, but it will be at least several days before they'll know whether it's going to relieve the pain that she has. Um, so uh, let's keep her in our prayers. And Don is going to consult a doctor tomorrow. Um, he's having some post-COVID issues and talking to Jimmy a moment ago. And Jimmy said uh, one thing is a, at least is a cough. And um, Jimmy said some people after COVID have had this for maybe three months or so. So uh, it's got to be a, annoying for, for Don and frustrating. So anyway, he's hoping to get some answers maybe uh, tomorrow from the doctor. Larry, yes. Wesley's not here. He's probably going to the uh, Who's that, Dale? Wesley Boyd. Wesley Boyd. Oh, Wesley. Okay. Uh, something found to his Okay. Did everybody hear that? There was already something wrong with his head. But... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I won't tell him you said that. <laughs> um, and I just noticed on my phone coming in that, um, you remember um, the young lady, Presley Hooper, who was baptized in April? Um, she's having some stomach ache problems and so severe that it's put her in the hospital six times this past month. 
So uh, her father, Joe, has requested prayers in her behalf. So uh, let's remember her. She's a uh, very sweet young lady that um, uh, uh, most of you, I'm sure, do remember her back in April. Several events coming up. Uh, I'll give them to you in the order in which they uh, are happening. It makes it easier for me and hopefully easier for you as well. This Friday, uh, singles, singles will be meeting this Friday at uh, the Chop House at 11.30 a.m. Then our son let us know that uh, their congregation, Hickory Heights in Lewisburg, is having a singing this Friday, and that'll be from 6.30 to 8 p.m. 6.30 to 8 p.m. That's the Hickory Heights Congregation in Lewisburg. And then we don't want to forget our gospel meeting with uh, Brother John LeBerry in um, a week from this Sunday. So let's keep those in mind. As I begin to extend the Lord's invitation tonight, since we're so close to the first of the year, we're in it uh, several days now, uh, it's not too late to begin Bible reading. And I understand, as you do, that Bible reading is not an end of itself. It's not a substitute for Bible study. But Bible study and Bible reading do complement one another. It's a light Bible study when we read because hopefully we're thinking about what we're reading and it brings up questions and we may go look up the questions uh, or look up the answers. And, uh, but again, that's not a substitute for Bible study. But it's a good thing to, at least for me, I know, and it's probably true with you as well, I'd hate to go beyond a year or even, I even hate to go that long and not have read certain sections of the Bible. Now, of course, uh, Mitch and Zach do a good job, uh, and the elders uh, planning different books for us to study and so forth, but uh, you can't get them all in in a year, obviously. And uh, so if you're not reading your Bible every year, there are sections and places in, in uh, that, you know, it may be two or three years since, or maybe even longer. So I would encourage you to do that. And I mention that also because as you read, you begin to see the story of redemption unfolding. And as, as Mitch has mentioned so often, uh, so much go, comes right back to the beginning. And we find the first couple sinning in, in Genesis chapter 3. And... Then as we go on, we see the Israelites who sin and they go into captivity. And then when we get to the New Testament, uh, sin is still a problem. It's a sin, it's a problem uh, with individuals throughout the scriptures. And something needs to be done about it. And the Lord knew just how to do that. And he sent his son to die on the cross so that we might have hope of eternal life. And Without him doing that, we would have had no hope whatsoever. No matter how good we might think we were, it wouldn't have been good enough. And we're still not going to get in on what we do. We're going to get into heaven because of God's grace, God's mercy. But you have to be in the right relationship with the Lord. And in order to do that, one needs to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. I know that I'm talking tonight to probably most of you have already done that. But to any who have not yet been baptized in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the Savior of the body. You have to be a member of the body, the body being the church, as Paul says in Ephesians. And if you're not a member of the, of the church that Jesus died for, you're not going to make it into heaven, or at least you have no hope. What the Lord does in the day of judgment is up to him, but you have no hope if getting into heaven unless you obey the Lord and his commandments. And hopefully, during singing the invitation song, you will 
want to do that, and there's, again, no better time to do that than tonight. If you're already a member and you feel that you are not as close to the Lord as you should be because of sin and you want the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, now would be a good time to let that be known as together we stand and sing. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. as we go to our Father in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, pleased as ever to be able to have this opportunity to worship you, to spend time with our Christian family, to study from your word. Father, we are thankful for this warm and comfortable building that we have here before us. We're thankful for all the material blessings that you have been so kind to bestow upon us. Father, we pray that as always, we won't ever take these things for granted. We pray that we won't take the spiritual blessings you have gifted unto us for granted either. We know that you have blessed each of us with talents, with gifts that we can go out into this world and minister unto others. Father, we pray that you would give us the zeal and the strength to go out and do these things. Father, we are very cognizant at this time of those of this number and those who may be friends or relatives of this number who are sick, who have ongoing illnesses, or who may have medical uh, concerns or complications. Father, we pray for each of these that in your wisdom that you would do what is best for them. Bless them with their health if it is your will. And Father, as always, we are so thankful when you answer our prayers in the affirmative when it regards to the health of those that we care and love so much. But we also realize that sometimes that answer is no, and so we would pray for acceptance and grace from those who may not get that positive answer that we so look for. Father, as we continue this evening, as we study from your word, we pray that you'll be with the teachers, that they can clearly remember their studies. Pray that you'll be with those who are listening, that we might have open minds and open hearts, ready to accept the words that are said if they apply to your will for us, and be better servants in your kingdom, Father, because we know that there is a vast harvest out there of souls who need you. As always, at the end of the day, we are most thankful for your son, for his life and his death, that sacrifice. And then when he rose from the grave, having defeated death. And for this, we are so very thankful. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we are in the fourth lesson on Christians in the culture. And if you are looking ahead, we're going to go back for a second. But if you're looking ahead, we got some some pretty powerful discussions um, next week dealing with the um, conversation of love and sex. 
the following week on the Christian and transgenderism. And then right after our gospel meeting, we got one with uh, the Christian in politics and then on race on the following week. So we got a lot of heavy hitting um, discussions. I hope you take the time to not just read about these things, but do some do some research, do some prayer that will really prepare your hearts and your minds for these discussions, because without that prayer, Sometimes these discussions can go sideways, and we don't want that happening. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Pray about those things. Uh, last week, as we were looking at um, what the church's role is with social media, one of the things that I mentioned to you was perspective. And that's exactly how Ken Welliver, uh, I think, doesn't he preach up here in Nashville, the north side of Nashville? Okay, I had that another brother. Okay. Anyway, he... Um, he goes to a very beautiful illustration, and I, I'm going to go to Ezra 3 once more. But in that il illustration, he talks about this amazing architect who is um, wanting to have this cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral, built. And this person comes along and is asking them, you know, what do you do here? And, of course, the response is, and this is in the first paragraph, right? He says to one, he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm cutting stone, and I work four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon. That was his response. He asks the same question to the next person, and the second person says, I'm just making a living. I earn six pence a day. Completely different response as the first person and how he viewed his perspective on what he does. And then here's the beautiful third response when he was asked, what he was doing, he stops and looks up and smiles and, and with a wave of his hand exclaims, I'm building the world's greatest cathedral for Sir Christopher Wren. And with, I, mean, I could just imagine as it's being stated with just being so proud and privileged to have the opportunity to be building for this architect, this amazing building. Three different perspectives. I believe when we're talking about any of these subject matters, we can look at it from a multitude of perspectives. Which one resonates with you in a way that would encourage you? First one? Not so much. Nor the second. But the third one? Yeah? And that's the thing about what we're looking at with the role of the Lord's church in society. What is our role, how do we engage it? What is our perspective? And again, in Ezra chapter 3, when, when the Israelites are coming back from their Babylonian captivity, you have people who are building the foundation after the temple had been destroyed, so they're rebuilding it, right? And notice in verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, the, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. So the king has directed, we're going to celebrate. And we're going to do so praising God in this way. So they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good. His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Look at the perspective from some. In verse 12, yet many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of, the, of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted for joy. You see, perspective has everything to do with the way we're looking at what is my life like? What is the purpose of, of my walk with God? How do I view church, if you will? And do I have this real modern view that if we have, I think, um, I'm reading a book right now, and we're seeing the church in Western, the Western Hemisphere that is shrinking day by day. And it's just a fact. What is a perspective? What are those churches that are growing? And I'm not just talking about where you could say, well, you know, they're, do they're growing because, and it's X, Y, Z, and that may be the case. But even statistically, a lot of the numbers in these churches 
are also going, getting smaller. But there are churches that are growing. Why? Right? When they're striving to serve the Lord, what is it that they're doing that's growing? And you're going to see a, a very different perspective in the way the membership of Christians are engaged in their giving communities as a body of believers. Right? So that's what we're looking at tonight. We're looking at what is the role of church in society. And the very first thing we need to do is ask the question, well, what is church? Right? So how do we look at the word church? And I'm wanting you to go beyond simply opening up your Webster's and, and going to Vine's Expository or whatever. What is the church? It's the called, <clears throat> the called out servants in Jesus Christ. Okay. Locally or universally? Are you asking or are you stating? <laughs> I'm asking the question. Okay. Which one do you want to talk about? I'm talking about what is the church. I'm leaving it broad on purpose. Because <laughs> I would answer yes to your question then, if it's a question. <laughs> so what is the church? Called out? It's the people. Is the people? People that are called out to what? For what? The bride of Christ. We're called out from this world. From the world. Called out to Jesus, right? We're supposed to be disciples, okay. followers of the discipline of Christ. Okay. And so we're talking about a group of people that are leaving a certain way of lifestyle, right? That's where we're going to follow Jesus. And so all these people that have been set aside by the blood of Jesus, right? So that invitation that Larry gave us along these lines. And now, who are these people? What do they look like? How do they live? And so that's what our brother Ken is talking about with this particular lesson, right? So when he says he's going to build his church, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 following, right? Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What does that look like? And so as Linda's saying, it's the people. We're talking about human beings who are called out, right? But we very conveniently talk about church in ways like, I'm going to church. And typically we might talk about a location where we're going to be meeting with people, but we're going to this building. We talk about it that way. And then sometimes with our discussions, because of the, the areas and how we have grown in the scriptures and what have you, we're talking about, well, like Ted is doing, dis distinguishing. Are we talking about universal? And what is the word for universal? A very ancient word for the Lord's church. Catholic. 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 So in a, in a very simplistic way, not from a sectarian way, just simplistic way, when we're talking about the Lord's church, all the saved of all time, it's Catholic, right? Now, we've got modern views on what Catholic looks like, and we think Catholicism, but that's what the Lord's church is. It is universal. But it's also because we are human beings, and we live within a time frame, and within a geographic region, we talk about churches in a very local, concentrated community way, right? So we see these two different ways, and both would be correct, right? We're talking about all the saved of all time, right, in Christ, but we're also talking about people who are living right now. And here we are, we're all alive, and we are right here in Franklin, Tennessee, and we're made, making up this thing we call the church or the local church in Franklin, right? Most of the time when we're reading of Scripture and we're talking about the church, we're talking about human beings in geographic regions, and sometimes that that. Um, conversation can be transient, going from something local to something universal, okay? So it's with this in mind that we're talking about what is it that we, the church, the people of God, do and how do we function in our society? So with that in mind, I want to open up some discussion. What is it that we do? How do we function in Franklin, Tennessee or Middle Tennessee? Is it? By our examples. Okay, by examples. So we get into some of what Ken is talking about here. Um, when we look at the first part, I think it's on page 45. But like, what does it look like in the day to day? Typically. We're supposed to be distinguishable. Okay. Where people's notice 
Uh, it refers to us as a peculiar people. We're different. Okay. How would we be different? Yeah. How, are we different because of the clothes we wear? Nope. Could be. We're different because we're saved. We're different because we are saved. Would that difference show up in the way we live life because we are saved? It's supposed to. Supposed to. Maybe right now it's a good time to reflect on is it, right? So, you know, what does it look like? When, when we had 10 men that had leprosy and they're all wanting Jesus to heal them. Perspective, right? How was the one distinguished from the other nine? He came back humbly to Jesus and thanked him. Oh, he was so grateful. So grateful. Look at individuals that respond one way versus another. So if again we're looking at perspective, in the modern American church, what does church look like? Here's the way I see a stereotype. And that's all it is is a stereotype. It's not, I'm not talking about the individual. Again, Western culture. Well, honey, it's uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Are we going to go to church? Right? Maybe we've determined we're going to go to a church service. And we go there, and you're going to do those acts of worship. And now it's, hey, that sermon needs to get done pretty soon because we're hungry. Right? And then we go on, and we eat our lunch, and then we go on with our day. Is that a fair statement of a stereotype in the Western world of church? It's one of them. One of the stereotypes. Okay. But it, is it fair? Okay. But what's wrong with the picture? If that's a stereotype, and, it, and if you agree that it is a fair stereotype, what's wrong with that picture? Jordan? It's not uh, from a time perspective, right? It's not consistent. If you think about just the overall, I don't know how many hours or a week, but you know we're called to we're called to live. Okay. For that example, we're called to live like Christ. So in that regard, you know the, the one or two or even three hours a week, and just doing that does not show the contrast that. Okay. You know we were talking about from a standpoint of how we're supposed to stand out from the world. So Jordan's bringing up if you could not hear him on th that other side of the building. Jordan's thing was a time perspective. So my question, just kind of like succinctly ask this, do we stop becoming the church when we are outside of the four walls of these buildings? Mm -hmm. Of course not. And so the church is always the church, right? In fact, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. In fact, 1 through 4. Notice the way Luke write to Theophilus about the church. So there's this guy, his name is Saul. He was, of course, we all know him as the Apostle Paul now, but he was Saul. And he was in hearty agreement with putting him, Stephen, Acts chapter 7, putting Stephen to death. On that day, a great persecution. Now, this is upon Stephen's death. On that day, a great persecution began against the church. At Jerusalem. It doesn't tell us what day of the week it was that this persecution started, but that it started on this particular day nonetheless. And the church then is being scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. This church that was in Jerusalem has been scattered now so that it's in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, except the apostles, that is. So some devout men buried Stephen, made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church. So if we take what Linda is saying, he's ravaging people who are making up this community we call the church. Right? So the church is not just this when we come together. When we come together as a church, which is a statement the Apostle Paul uses. But that doesn't mean that's, that's the end all be all. And then when we're outside the body, and we're individuals that somehow the church doesn't exist. Church still exists. The church still functions. The church is still representing her bridegroom. 
And so these are things that are very fundamental that we need to have in mind as we go forward with the conversation. Because, to Jordan's point then, if all we are is just meeting a few hours out of the week, how does that few hours, when we're right here and we're not in the world shining light for the world to see, how can we, right? And so this is very crucial that we're talking about the role the church has in society because most of our lives are outside in society. Is it not? Linda. Well, I feel that people come to church services, check their box off, and leave. They're doing that to make themselves feel good. Look what I've done. But the whole purpose of worshiping is to please God. And the way we please God, if we live it when we step out of this building, that's how we live it and please God. Just coming to church once on Sunday and checking that box does not please God. <coughs> sure. This is a, makes us feel good. Yeah. I mean, sh can we get pleased by being here? I hope so. We stir up love and good works when we sing the songs like Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in Me, which is what our author has, has quoted from, right? If we're going to do what Phil is talking about, that we're going to be examples for the world, then yeah, that's how the church is going to be a beautiful image of her head, Jesus. And this is where we talk about those three things of how we are to imitate Christ. One of the very first things that our brother does, it's on page 45, is to say, to follow the example of Jesus. And I, I remember using this statement similar to this, in fact, these three main points uh, throughout the years of preaching here, is to say that if we're going to be looking at ourselves as being examples to the world and living as lights for this world, how do we know that what we are doing is pleasing to God? We look at the one who is a perfect example, the one who lived life fully, beautifully for the Father. We're talking about the firstborn in Jesus, right? He is a great example where he is tempted in every which way, Hebrews 4, but yet without sin. And so we try to imitate him. We try to emulate what he is like and unto how we live our lives. All right, so the question then we're going to ask and we're going to, not dive into this, but just talk about it a little bit, is what was Jesus doing that we would follow his example? Think about it. There's things in my head, but I want, I want to ask you, what were some of the things that he did that we could follow his example? Having compassion on the people he came in contact with. Yeah, Scripture is very clear about the compassion that Jesus had for people. Um, Zach and I were having a Bible study. It's Thursday night Bible study last week, and uh, we were in Luke chapter seven, and it talks about this person that Jesus had compassion over. And what is typical when you do some of the um, readings, or you might go back to some other Bible studies and lessons that you might hear, you'll hear something along the lines of "Yes." But really the focus is on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and that the miracle that he did was to show that he's the Son of God. And I'm not taking that away from that point because that's a true point. It's a fair point, but it's not the point that the passage was actually talking about. The passage explicitly is talking about the fact that Jesus had compassion on that individual. If the, if the scripture is telling us the import of the passage, then we should not minimize that. We should actually be right in line in harmony with what the text really was talking about. And it was not to show that he is the son of God. That is a totality type thing, right, of all the scriptures. This passage is focused in on the compassion. At least that was the discussion that we're talking about. Larry? What impresses me is that Christ, before he selected his apostles, prayed all night long. And I look at my prayers and... Uh, I've never prayed all that long or anything close to that. Yeah. He, in a very deep, sweet, intense communion with the Father. Absolutely. Yeah. And consider the fact that he's praying all night long. And who are these individuals that he chose to be his ambassadors, his leaders? Who did he choose? Yeah. Got some fishermen here. 
these guys weren't the ones that made it through um, Jewish school as a five-year-old where they go on and graduate and then move on to the, the middle school, junior high level, if you will, and, and then follow these rabbis and become apprentices. These were common people. You have a tax collector. He's not so common. He's hated. You have zealots. I mean, what kind of motley crew does he have that he's praying for all night long? Right? But that's, that's who he wants to represent. He wants every single person from every walk of life to represent him. Right? And so all these people that he's praying for, the fact that he has compassion, what else? Wash the apostles' feet. So it's, it's, it's something that is tied with compassion, with the idea of who we are. And this kind of gets into the second point of the, the lesson in this study is we are here with purpose to serve. Right? In the kingdom of men, where is the best place to be? If you want to get notoriety, if you want to have power. On top. On top. Yeah. So you become the president, the CEO, whatever the situation is, right? Top dog. And you have the passage that um, is being referred to where, you know, people are wanting to know, you know, can we sit on your right hand, your left hand, right? James and John, that is. And Jesus says what? Serve. And so that passage in John chapter 13, um, in the night that Jesus is betrayed, the author brings it out, Ken brings it out, where he says that it, is, it was the common practice, which I did not know this, that you would get slaves, servants, and that they would come and wash your feet. The practice I was aware with custom, manners and customs are whatever house you go to, it is the person who lives there who would show and extend hospitality and wash the feet of those who come into their home. So this is a place where nobody was the owner per se, because this is someone else's place, and Jesus and the apostles were using this place. But Jesus takes the opportunity nonetheless, right? And he serves. He serves all kinds of people for all kinds of compassionate reasons. But what's the, why serve? What, it, what does that get for us in representing Christ by being servants? It fulfills the second greatest commandment. Okay. So Leviticus 19, verse 18 says what? Love thy neighbor as thyself, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. That is the way we are told in Matthew 22, verse 39, you know, what are the great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang the law and the prophets. So when you stop and think about what is it that I'm doing if I'm going to be following Jesus and Jesus is saying, here is the greatest commandments. Then I'm going to be following him. And what that following is going to look like is I'm going to be serving. And so when we look at the way the church is set up, how does the church follow Jesus? What does it look like on a day to day basis with what things we do? How do we serve? Who do we serve? We already got the why because Ted gave us that answer that because we're going to love our neighbor. But how, what does it look like, Jordan? I mean, there's, there's lots of answers to the question. That is correct. <laughs> um, one, one that I'm thinking about based on your last question about how Jesus, or what Jesus did, um, is he served a lot of people who weren't followers of he served a lot of people, um, which again is him serving in general is contrary, right? Contrast. We're talking about different, wanting to be the top dog typically, but what is the, the reverse of that? And then he also served a lot of people that, you know, I think as, as members of the church, that, that we should be sharing that love and compassion in the opportunities that we get. And I think that was one thing that Jesus did a lot of was he was out in the world you know, just living his life with his followers, with his disciples, yeah. he, those, those opportunities presented themselves, right? Just like they present us. And then he rose to that occasion 
and we see so many examples of how he just, where people met him, he served. And so I, maybe to answer about example. us doing it, what, what passage does come to your mind of when Jesus served someone that wasn't necessarily followers of him? Samaritan woman. The Phoenician woman. Phoenician woman. How about the wedding in Cana? I mean, it wasn't his time, he says, to his mom, right? But yet he goes and serves and, and creates this new wine for the wedding guests. I mean, it was not his time. Number of examples that we can get. All right, so what are some ways that we can be going about serving, whether it's I, I'm, I have Galatians 6, 10 in my head. Do good to all men, especially the household of faith. So how do we serve each other in what ways? What are some ways that are going on right now? Well, if, if we truly are a family, which I believe we are here, we know the needs of the ones in our family, just like you do in your physical family. Yeah. And it may be a telephone call or cards, a letter, prayers, uh, listening, uh, some women take in food. I mean, there's visiting the sick, you know, checking in on people, uh, being concerned. Uh, there's so many, like yes. Jordan said, so many ways. And with all the groups that were uh, getting started up, we're going to get even closer and know even more of, of ways to serve each other. And then from those groups, hopefully go out and be able to serve in yeah, those groups are vehicles for us to be able to serve. So think about this. Perspective once more. I'm, I'm just keeping it real. I'm going to ask you, be honest. And if, if the answer is where it's going to seem negative, so be it. How many of you get tired of all the emails that come out? I get one, two, three. Okay. They, see, now, once one person raises their hand. And so, what's that? Get over it. Get um, what did you say, Phil? Come out from what? Like our Just like we have our email. news emails. Just in general, been getting emails. I'm sorry for um, our church emails. Okay. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> church email. Sorry. <laughs> That's where I need to be a bit more specific. Church emails. You get tired of. Oh, okay. Some of still raising hand. Okay, I got six or seven. That's that's a decent percentage. Here's the thing. For maybe we can do better about how we send it, as digest, and what have you. What would be the alternative? What is the alternative to an overabundance of communication? Or well, let, me, let me flip that. What is the opposite of an overabundance of communication? No communication. How many of you love no communication? <laughs> kind of a tough question to raise your hand to. Because you want communication, you don't want over communication, but what is too much, right? Especially when people are asking. So to your point, Sheila, like, um, you know, we have brethren that are going to be in need and brethren who have been in need, right? Ron just had his surgery. David's going to have his knee surgery. We have brethren that are sick with COVID and a number more that are getting sick right now. And if there is no communication, how can we serve each other, right? Difficult to do that. Jordan and Paul? I think to part of the, um, the communication front is the relationships. I think that's the most important. Like, I, I mean, I raised my hand for the church email thing, but that's just because, of, you know, it's, I, I get a lot of emails like yeah. Phil's complaining about. But the, you know, the actual individual relationships that we have are, are so much more important than that, too. For, for not just sending out an email blast, but me being able to reach out and say, hey, I, you know, I know we're close. You know I've been struggling with this. I need your help. Or yes. you know, when we find out someone's in need and then you know, three people are able to quickly you know, get meals and, and take that person. So I think it's the personal relationships that are such an importance in, in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of this reciprocating effect. The opportunities to be able to connect with each other will take place so that through the vehicles that we have, through the various groups and meetings that we have throughout the weeks, those are ways we get closer to each other. And naturally, if we're so in tune with each other's lives, we're having these communications without email, right? It's through our relationships. 
Phil. I think we need to get, this is really what Ken's talking about is with society, not, not within the church. Which I think he's talking about society. How can we make a difference? How are we gonna deal with that? Well, number one is one-on-one, -on -one, and number two is your examples. Yeah. By being examples in, in listening. Listen to what people say. Yes. People you work with compliment things to them. If, when you compliment a coworker, they remember that. And that's huge in our <clears throat> generation here because nobody says good job anymore. You know, unless I guess you're having a your annual review or something, but uh, you know, we just need to be more positive just yeah. with everybody. Yeah. In general, our neighbors, you know, the guy next door annoys me doing this or that, you know, I can't, you know, the Bible tells you to live peaceable among people, but you know, it's sometimes it's difficult. Yeah. To your point, before you get to Brad, one thing that for, I've heard over the 30 whatever years of preaching is, I don't know how to work with my neighbor. And you gave some wonderful practical situations here. And that's why Galatians 6.10 is about, you know, do good to all men. One of the best ways you start being able to serve is serve those that are closest to you, that are easy, hopefully, to serve. But it's to be able to transition that service mindset to not just your family. And so I love what you're saying because it brings us to the import of this lesson itself. And that is the society itself that is in darkness, that doesn't get to see this type of service. But if the church is, Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47, if the church is showing love to each other, being there for each other, guess what the world sees? They see a community of servants with each other. But let me take it to what Phil is talking about, and that is when we're reaching out beyond the body of Christ. That's going to be huge. Huge. That's the reason why we have our benevolence box that we use to help people throughout the years. Right? It's, in fact, I'll share this. It's the reason why we have people in the community that actually give to the work of the Lord here at Franklin because of reaching out past this church, if you will. So, Brad. <clears throat> Building on what Phil and you were talking about, something that stood out to me, page 46, halfway down the page. He says, when we as people become known as cantankerous, unreasonable, and contentious in our social interactions, we are failing to model the character of Christ. Amen. So positivity is not being negative all the time. I mean, it sounds silly to say, um, to that point, because I had that underlined to talk about, actually, um, I heard it said this way, talking about negativity. When, when you are negative, that's what we focus on. Like, imagine you're skiing down the slopes, and all you hear is, don't hit the tree. You know what happens? Versus, ski where there's snow. <laughs> right? It's a focus. Um, and believe it or not, there's some science behind that statement in that it's what you're focused on. And so when we're talking about this community where, in fact, if the world looks in and sees the church as being cantankerous, if it sees the church as being unreasonable, contentious, then we're, we are failing in that model to emulate him, which is that first point, right? We're going to image Christ before we get into that service. Phil and then Ron. Well, I was just going to say this is kind of corny, but, uh, you know, one of the examples of, of what you just said is, uh, you know, and I've told Wanda before, like, we'll be talking about doing something, and I'll say, well, there's a 60% chance of rain. <laughs> well, there's a 40% chance of no rain. Amen. But, I mean, with that, what do we think about? When it says there's a 20% chance of rain, what are, what are you thinking? No potluck. <laughs> 20% chance of rain, no potluck. <laughs> no. But to that point, that's how a lot of life goes unlived because of those forecasts, especially if it's a negative forecast. Yeah. Ron. Yeah. I think about Steve and Heather Fisher. Uh, 
somewhere they lived, Tulsa or wherever they were before they were here. Uh, they were not Christians and had real no interest in being a, a Christian. And because the, of the influence of a neighbor, whether that person said anything or exhibited something, but it piqued her interest to find out yes. something about these people and why they were, were like they were. And then Steve later, uh, and we know where they ended up. Uh, and, and, it's, uh, and that's not the only example of that. Sure. Uh, but it's, it's fresh on my mind because yeah. I know Steve and Heather uh, that they had no interest their interest was piqued. They obeyed the gospel. They became powerful servants of Christ. And, uh, and even to this day. So let me ask this question. I want to ask you as believers, for those who are visiting, how powerful is it when you see someone behave like Jesus? That, has it affected you? It's a rhetorical question, but I want you to really respond emotionally to that question because if it's that, if it is in something that affects you, then my goodness, how much more should we be living this life, right, to emulate him so that we are not only image bearers, but we're practicing that model of Jesus in our service to one another. I got multiple hands raised. Phil. Well... Now I know what it's like to be Richard Terry. I've made four or five comments. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I was going to say. I think, I think something good right now in this class, an example would be Steve Mason about how they came to the Lord. And I think if he told or she told what happened, I think it would be good examples for us to go out. Yeah. Well, so just for you guys to know, I've talked to our elders about this a uh, few months ago, and I said this is what I would like to do this year at some point. I have not figured out when, but I would love um, to take some of the sermon time throughout the year and have actual interviews during our service with our elders for moments like that, what you just said, Phil, because I think it would be very important for our church family to know who our leaders are even more intimately, and this is a great way for that to happen. Um, so, yeah, that would be a re really good thing. Ron, and then someone else, was it Jordan, or someone else had their hand up? Okay. Go ahead, Ron. No, <coughs> Jordan. Who else? Miss, Miss Linda. Linda. Jimmy. <laughs> oh, and Linda, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you threw it, Jordan? You. Jordan <laughs> deferred to you. <laughs> I've been sitting here listening to all this, and let's go back to when you first started this study. You said, I think you had reference to the church. How could you see the church in our everyday activity, whatever? Let's look at the Apostle Paul said, be ye imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the group or other people see these people that are imitating Paul? Now, that's question. Now, after Stephen's uh, sermon and all, and there was great persecution, and the church fled, went everywhere, and the Stephen uh, and uh, Paul was, Saul was in persecution to the church, what did he look for? I mean, they didn't have signs on them that said, I'm a Christian. They, were, they blended in. They were every day, every day. They looked alike, basically. So what was stood out? Now, the next point is, when you ask, the, how do we show forth the church? Mm -hmm. I don't think that the, the, the delivery man, the postman, my neighbor, by looking at me can tell I'm a Christian. But my mental attitude toward helping them or stand as a light and let them know that I love them and I want to help. That's living the life of Christ there. Exactly yeah, what it is. Succinctly, you shall know them by their fruit. You're going to know people by their fruit. And when you see the type of life that, that Jesus has, it is impactful upon others. That's why they were following him. Not just the fact that he had miracles, but the way he loved on his fellow man. 
right? And so that's really crucial when we're talking about this. In fact, I want you to go to um, Luke chapter 4. This is a quotation back on Isaiah 61. I want you to see this picture where we're looking at modeling Jesus, and then the last thing is the message of Jesus. So notice this. He opens a scroll of Isaiah, and it goes right to the place, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Luke 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to send proclamation of release to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. And when you take the Sermon on the Mount, and blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those, and, and goes on, all the way down to persecuted for righteousness' sake, or for, for, his king, for the kingdom's sake. All of these people who are looking at this kingdom that is so different than the kingdoms of the world, were clamoring for it. Like, I can be in this kingdom? Most people, you have an exclusive club and you have to be good enough. He's taking the poor and the blind. He's taking all those that would be discarded in society, basically. That's what allowed people who wanted the gospel. And brethren, if I can just say it one more time, look at who when we share the gospel to, think of your family, think of your friends, think of your neighbors, and how many have responded to the good news of Jesus. And then think about the people who have been incarcerated. Think about the people who are homeless. Think about people who are just like really down in the dumps with life. Who responds? And sometimes I've heard some negative things like, well, they're only responding because. Well, then that could have been said of the people of Jesus' day. They only responded because they were poor. They only responded because they were blind. They only responded because they had some kind of need. It's because they're the ones that see their need for salvation, for deliverance, more clearly, more easily, more readily. Right? And so if we're going to be imitators of Christ, if we're going to be showing forth the message of Jesus, we need to seek all people, but that includes people that don't always look like us, and what we look like is, well, we got it together to them. And that's not true. We don't have it all together. We need Jesus every day. And when we can show, not, not show that, um, hey, you know, I'm a sinner and a lowly me and all that. No, no, no. I'm saved from my sins. But I need Jesus every day. I need him every hour. We even have hymns along these lines that we've sung. People relate to that. It's what Jesus was doing when he was reaching the message of, of good news. And really, the gospel should be good news. You're coming into a kingdom of salvation, not a kingdom of oppression. And therein lies who we are as a, as a body of believers to a world in darkness. Let that really sink in. We get that, we will be sharing gospel with everybody. And there's going to be a lot of people that are hurting, that will hear it, that will want it, because it's very attractive to someone who wants deliverance. Right? Any final thoughts? Our time is just about up. We need to be careful about uh, qualifying people ahead of time. Amen. Uh, Jim Boyd, when he did his thing here about uh, simple soldier. Mm -hmm. He talked about there was an officer when he was uh, in Iraq or someplace. Said he's the most vile person he had ever met in his life. Every other word that came out of his mouth was some form of cursed word. Said he was just the most horrible person you can imagine. So he stayed away from. And he said, he found out, I think, after he retired from the military, he was talking to somebody else, and they said, did you hear about Colonel so-and-so? He said, he, he finally was converted to some denomination. Jimmy, telling the story, started crying. He said, I never said a word to him. Yeah. And, and we can do that. We do that. We, we qualify. He, he's a candidate. He's not. Yeah, and, and that, that's not, that's not good on us to do that. No, no, not at all. Yeah, we, we, should, we should love everyone and show that love through not just our actions in serving, but in the sharing of the good news. Yeah, 
absolutely. And our time is up, but go ahead, Jim. Okay, I think, this, I think it's a, if I remember the song that Ted led tonight, let the beauty of Christ be seen in me. Amen. Describe that in a term where we can understand the beauty of Christ. Yes. All right, great discussion. We could really go so much more into this. Um, think of some personal applications, again, to the way we can reach out to society. Phil did a great job of giving some very specific things. Um, Sheila did a great job of showing the very specific things that we can do to serve each other. But that's what the church is to be in this society, not just to society, but within this society. All right, God bless you all. Have a wonderful remainder of this week, and God willing, we'll see you on Sunday.